Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. It's nice to see you all. Pardon my uh, my very loud cat in the background. She'll be out, she'll be out in just a minute. Uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, hello. My name is Nick. It's very nice to see you. Welcome back to Conversations with Authors. Uh, today we bring to you Jonathan uh, Myberg, author of A Most Remarkable Creature, and Jonathan Slatt, uh, who is in conversation today, um, and who I'll get to in a minute. But before we get to both of our speakers properly, allow me to welcome you back to Book Passages Conversations with Authors series. If you've seen one of these events before, it's nice to see you back again. Um, but if you're new here, then Book Passage is a group of independently run bookstores out of the San Francisco Bay Area, and we host and run book talks just like these very often throughout the week. Um, as we are streaming these on YouTube, and will continue to do so in the future, as well as having a number of in-person events in both of our San Francisco and Corte Madera stores, um, but while you're here and happen to be watching online, uh, please consider subscribing by clicking the subscribe button just below the video. It's completely free to you and honestly really helps us out and adds an added bonus. If you click the little bell right next to the subscribe button, you'll be alerted every time that we go live uh, with one of these talks so you don't have to miss out on something you otherwise might have really enjoyed. Uh, if you'd like to check out our upcoming events or just like the idea of an email newsletter more, you can find both of those at bookpassage.com. If you'd like to check out our speaker's book, tonight, which again is a most remarkable preacher, or any of the other books that are here that are mentioned here tonight. Uh, while we were in the green room, they were talking about a lot of different writings, so I'm, I'm certain you'll have a lot to look through today. Um, regardless, you can find a most remarkable preacher as the first link in the description just below the video. Finally, if you have any questions for us tonight, please write them in the YouTube chat. That is the only way to get your questions to the speakers, so please do not miss your chance. Now, allow me to introduce Jonathan Myberg, uh, who in 1997 received the Thomas J. Watson Fellowship to travel to remote countries around the world, a year-long journey that sparked his enduring fascination with islands, birds, and the deep history of the living world. Since then, he's written views, features, and interviews for print and online publications, including The Believer, The Talk House, The Appendix, on subjects ranging from a hidden exhibit hall at the American Museum of Natural History to the last long-form interview with uh, Peter Mathewson. Uh, he's best known uh, as leader of the band <laughs> Shearwater, <laughs> whose uh, albums and performances have often been praised by NPR, The New York Times, The Guardian, and Pitchfork. He lives in Central Texas. In conversation tonight, we have Jonathan Slatt, uh, who is a wildlife biologist and author working full-time for the Wildlife Conservation Society as their Russia and Northeast Asia coordinator, uh, a task that includes owls, tigers, and migratory water birds across Asia. His work takes him from the tundra of Alaska and Northeast Russia to the coastal mudflats of Thailand and Cambodia. In addition, he is one of the world's foremost experts on Blackson's fish owl. Uh, he writes a semi-regular blog for Scientific American called East of Siberia and is a regular contributor to WCS Wild View, a photo blog. His other writings, scientific research, and photographs have been featured in the BBC World Service, uh, the New York Times, The Guardian, Smithsonian Magazine, New Yorker, Abaddon Magazine, among many others. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to introduce these two to you. One last time, if you have any questions, please write them in the chat, uh, and I'll make sure that they get over to. But let me to introduce you to both of our authors today. Welcome. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from here if I can. Um, yeah, I do appreciate what Book Passage is doing by offering these, these talks. Um, and I bet you have copies of the owl book too somewhere. So if that's uh, people are interested in books about owls, maybe, maybe Book Passage has them as well. Um, so Jonathan, two things. First of all, well, first of all, great to see you again. Um, yeah, good to see you. Happy, happy birthday. It uh, sounds Thanks. like you're just, just feel, finishing up your, your 46th. And also thank you for staying up late. Uh, you're no longer in North Texas as, as your bio uh, suggested. You're actually in uh, Hamburg now, correct? In yeah, Hamburg, Germany right now. So it's about 2.37 in the morning. So I'm, I'm a few IQ points <laughs> short of where I might normally be. Yeah, well, th thanks so much for, for doing this. Um, I know your, your book just came out uh, in paperback, the, um, the paperback edition. Um, and so I, I read this when it, uh, in, in hardcover right when it came out. And, um, you know, I'll say, you know, when I, when I sat down to, to read it, I really thought I was just going to get into another natural history book about birds, which is, which is great. But you know, there's, there's a quote on the back of the paperback um, from the, uh, the Dallas Morning News that says, to call this a bird book 
would be like calling Moby Dick a whaling manual. And I think that's <laughs> that's true, right? Because it's it's so much more than just about birds. You you get into uh, you get into this uh, you know, uh, William Henry Hudson, which I hope, I hope you'll talk about later. You know, this this, this, this naturalist. Um, you talk about uh, you know the formation of the world, um, as, as well as getting getting all the characters. So I guess my my first question for you um, is. I mean, you hadn't written a book before. So what made you write this book? What, what got you into this subject? Well, the, what, what got me into the subject was this chance meeting that I had with these bizarre birds in the Falklands back in 1997. Uh, and the, it was such an extraordinary moment that, because I, I didn't know that they existed, um, that I... Just a very pure kind of moment. I mean, you describe in your book seeing a black distance fish owl for the first time, and you just are like, "What the hell is that?" And it had the, exactly the same kind of moment with these birds. Let me let me share my screen with you here. Um, this is and obviously this is the cover, but this is the the species of caracara that sort of launched my journey into their world. Uh, striated caracara, but this is the first illustration that was ever made of them, but at least by a European in 1775. And what I love about this illustration is that you can, the, the bird comes right out through it to you. You can tell that the artist who's George Forster, who was on Captain Cook's uh, ship, the resolution saw this bird because it just captures exactly the way that they He's look at it. you. Yeah. This is uh, this was more like what my first meeting with them was like. Um, I, I, I went the Falklands on a, to, to look at uh, uh, human communities because I was doing this year long project at looking at remote human communities. They're really isolated around the world. And what, I wasn't particularly interested in birds, but I found out that you could see penguins in the Falklands. And uh, though I was there to, to visit the, the human community there, which is pretty extraordinary and unusual because it's a, a British, it was a British colony and it's, there's only about 3000 civilians and about as many soldiers on this, these islands. Um, way down off the off the coast of Argentina, uh, I just hadn't given the wildlife much thought at all. But people told me you could see breeding penguins there, and I thought, well, who didn't want to see that? So I went to see some penguins on this island. And while I was sitting there looking at the penguins, the group of these guys came up to me, and I was like, "What the hell is this? <laughs> I'd never seen any bird like this, um, the, much less one that acted like this." You can tell they look kind of like a somewhere between a hawk and a crow. They, um, they're they really good on their feet. They like walking and running around just as much as they like flying, which they're also very good at. And they just came up to me like, well, hey, you know, the, we got just as much right to be here as you, what are you doing? And um, it was just so stunning because it was so unusual. Wildlife doesn't usually behave like this around human beings um, unless it's really tame or really inexperienced. And in this case, um, it's the it's the latter. Uh, now, before we get into more about striated caracaras, because um, they're kind of the stars of the book as far as caracaras go, I should explain what caracaras that you and are. Um, this is also a caracara. It's the only one, if you live in California, that you're ever likely to see in the wild, because um, they do turn up. Um, I'll explain more about that later. But the, you can see this, there's, this is a really weird looking bird. Um, they're about the size of a, you know, a, a raven. Um, but they've got these long yellow legs and orange faces and these sort of striped feathers. And it, you're like, what, what is this? Is it a hawk? Is it a, um, it turns out actually they're falcons. Um, but they're not like anything that we normally think of when you think of a falcon. Um, they're scavengers and opportunists and they, they'll eat just about anything and they like hanging out with vultures. Um, this, I took this picture in, in South Texas and I love this turkey vulture just hanging out with Kara Kara everybody there. Um, but this is a, a falcon the way we normally think of them. It's a peregrine falcon. Um, peregrines, kestrels, merlins, birds like this are these uh, just peerless bird hunters. They're really, really fast. They're really deadly. And they're just especially good at killing other birds on the wing. Uh, and they're, they're kind of single-minded, you know, falconers who hunt with them. Um, I'd say you wouldn't really, you're not after a peregrine for its personality. They, they are, they're interested in feeding and that's, you know, about it. Um, but the peregrines and, and birds like this are sort of have captured the, the, the northern world. They're the ones, they're the falcons that we see in the northern part of the world. Um, 
And their group is sometimes called the true falcons, which is really a misnomer because they're actually kind of an aberrant lineage of falcons. The falcon family has its greatest diversity in sort of its original hearth in South America, which includes a bunch of birds that aren't like peregrine falcons at all. Like this is a, a, a laughing falcon, cute little snake special, snake eating specialist um, from the South American tropics. Uh, this is a cryptic forest falcon, also from the South American tropics, um, which acts sort of like a like a Cooper's hawk or a sharp shinned hawk. This bird was uh, described to science in 2015. <laughs> That's how little known um, this group is. Um, they, in general, a lot of the the birds in South America are lesser studied than their their cousins in the northern world. But the falcon diversity is really fascinating. Now Darwin, uh, but well, the caracaras, I should say, there are nine species of them, and they're found throughout South America in every single habitat um, that there is. One of them, however, uh, does does come as far north as as the southern United States which we'll get into more later. That's the one that you saw, the crested caracara with its orange face and yellow legs. But Darwin uh, also noticed the caracaras when he visited South America aboard the Beagle back when he was a, a young rich kid on a, on a wild adventure. He was 21, 22 years old. Um, and this is the only contemporary illustration of Darwin aboard the Beagle, actually made by Augustus Earle in 1833. And Darwin's at the center of the image here. Uh, and you can see, oops, there we go. Um, this is him in the top hat there. And you can see that these guys are all bringing him stuff. Uh, he's got a tusk down there next to his feet, says 2003 BC on it. There's a guy bringing him a whole palm tree. And this guy over here, who's my favorite, is bringing his hat filled with shells. And he says, the least I can get for these is a tot, as in a tot of rum, because um, Darwin was paying people to bring him stuff. Uh, over here, this guy says, I've killed a fine specimen of a flying monkey, shot three specimens of geese, and was very near being yaffled by a damn big bear. And sure enough, in his hands, he's got a flying monkey with, uh, with, a, with a dog uh, kind of showing some interest in it there. And uh, even though Darwin hadn't visited the Falklands yet at this point, that's where he went next. And in the Falklands, he would meet an animal that sealers and whalers actually called flying monkeys. And just to remind you where the Falklands are, here's South America. The Falklands are way down here. You can see it's only, uh, th this distance between there and the Antarctic Peninsula is only about 750 miles. Mm -hmm. So really far south. They're about the same size as uh, Connecticut. And you can see there's all these, uh, these two big islands and all these little tiny ones. Um, there's actually 750 islands in the Falklands, uh, which has really helped the, the wildlife uh, survive because on some of these small islands uh, introduced predators that, that plague the mainland like rats and cats and foxes and uh, pigs uh, have, never, uh, have never been introduced there. So what is there is an astonishing wealth of seabirds burrowing petrels and uh, albatrosses and penguins. And um, it's, it's just a, a world where every, every vertebrate animal is, is a bird, kind of like New Zealand used to be. I think up in the corner here, this, these are the Jason Islands. These are some of the most remote of the Falklands and, and have a huge uh, quantity of wildlife. This is uh, Grand Jason and Steeple Jason, which uh, figure prominently in the book. And this is a picture of Steeple Jason. Uh, it's my shadow in the foreground there. This is, you can get really close to penguins if you want to, because uh, they, as long as you don't move, they don't really act like you're there in particular. Uh, but, uh, and you can see flying in, Checking out these penguins is a young striated caracara. There's some more of them in the back here, actually, these dark shapes on the rocks. And these birds live around these colonies of penguins and albatrosses, tens and hundreds of thousands of birds. And in the summer months, there's just an abundance of chicks and eggs and stuff for them to feed on. Um, they like to eat uh, seal shit. They like to uh, you know, eat dead things. There's just so much food for them in the summer. And on this island, Steeple Jason, which is small enough that you can actually walk around the whole thing in a day, um, there are about 80 pairs of striated caracaras breeding during the summertime and about the same number again of younger birds who are waiting for their chance to breed. So it's just thick with them. Here's an adult there with the nice yellow legs on this guy and these sort of chestnut trousers. And um, you can see there, they really are almost raveny or crowy or something and don't look very falcon-like particular, or not what we think of when we think of a falcon. But uh, the problem is for them is that uh, winter comes and all the seabirds leave. They'll go to sea 
uh, where they can drink salt water, they can feed, they don't need land at all except to breed. But these caracaras are stuck. They don't migrate, they have to stay on these islands and they have to figure out how to survive until the seabirds return. Um, this one is uh, standing on the, a nest of a black-browed albatross right there, which all these sort of tire-shaped things are. The albatrosses build them out of mud. Uh, what you find them doing in the winter is a lot of this. They're digging in the ground on this island uh, for grubs and earthworms and other invertebrates. It, and when you go there, it looks almost like someone's turned pigs loose on the island. You'd never believe if I showed this to you. I mean, you can actually see it on the satellite image um, that this was being done by falcons. Uh, but they managed to survive quite well on this stuff. And it's a very typical sort of caracara behavior. To, they're, they're very good at finding new sources of food, making the most of what's there, finding resources that, um, that other, you know, a less uh, observant animal might miss. It's a group of uh, young birds here that are assembled near the carcass of a, uh, the rather old carcass of a sea lion that was in really terrible shape and they were just stuffing themselves with it. Uh, the, the one in the center there, you can see, this thing bulging out of his feathers is this bird is fine. He's not in any trouble. That's his crop, um, uh, sort of a, an extension of his esophagus that he's just filled up with food, um, bits of dead uh, sea lion skin that's very ancient and he's just as happy as can be. Uh, I took this picture also with my phone. Uh, this is as, how close you can get to them. Uh, they are just not bothered by human presence. And in fact, they're so interested in anything new that they'll just come right up to you and start trying to take things out of your bag. Uh, here's a, it, the, that's of course caused some problems for them where human beings are concerned. Um, there was actually a bounty placed on them by the Falkland Islands government uh, in the early part of the 20th century as uh, sheep farmers were less than enamored of them. Uh, and uh, Darwin also was really taken with them. Uh, he, he devoted more time to, to describing them in the voyage of the beagle than he did to any other bird and noted that they took hats and uh, compasses, all kinds of other inedible objects from the, from the crew of the beagle. They just seem insatiably attracted to anything that they haven't seen before, which makes them uh, really uh, kind of like, this is a typical scene uh, on islands where they live. This is on New Island and the Falklands, wondering what, you know, you, if I'm going to eat all of that potato. This is Lorraine McGill, and, uh, who lives on uh, Carcass Island in the Falklands, a, a terribly named and very beautiful island. Um, and there's a crew of young striated characters that are waiting for her to feed them some kitchen scraps. And uh, here's one with some of my hiking gear, and this is me taking a dinner order. Uh, actually, what this is, is, is a, uh, there's a trap here, um, uh, which is basically a piece of meat nailed to the ground with some little nooses on snares attached to it. And I was trying to ban some birds out of this group. Um, but uh, John, you spent in, in your book, you spent an awful lot of time just trying to figure out how to get an owl to come to a trap in the first place. Um, so, so I assume you could not do a thing like this in order to get an owl. Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> offensive to look at how easy it is to catch these guys, yeah. <laughs> It, it they just it, it, when you when you get them too if you you can you can get them in the hand and, and ban them and um, you know put them in a bag and weigh them you know it's all these sort of uh, alien abduction kind of things and then let them go and they'll just sort of stand there and look at you um, they might seem like their dignity has been offended a little bit but they kind of shake it off and sometimes they'll go and get back in the trap again because um, hey there's you know free meat is it only in the lean season that, that, that they'll come into a trap like that? Or will they go in there even when the, when the seabirds are, are breeding? Um, done it in both seasons. And it's hard to, I mean, it's, they're probably a little more likely to do it when, it, when they're really hungry. Um, but they're just so how, interesting. How long, are the, how long are the seabirds gone? What's the, how, how many months? Uh, not too many for all of them. Um, and there are a few that, do, that continue to roost there. Gentoo's still, still roost there um, throughout the... The winter, but there's no uh, no eggs or chicks. Um, there are cormorants and things like that, but the but there's you know the things that are really abundant uh, they provide lots and lots of food. The penguin eggs, the, the penguin chicks, the um, the burrowing petrels, which they catch as they return to their burrows at night, or they even excavate them with their feet. Those are are not there. Uh, and, and there's less, um, the, the birds, the, they pair up in the summertime and although some of the pairs persist through the winter, uh, not all of them do. So you get these big aggregations of, of sort of 
all age classes of birds all hanging out together. Uh, in England, there are a surprising number of captive striated caracaras, and I, I spend a whole chapter of the book explaining how that came to be. I won't get into it here, um, but it involves a guy who called himself the penguin millionaire or the penguin king, and he's got a really cool story. Uh, but this is one of them. This is a bird named Tina, um, who was uh, worked with a falconer named Jeff Pearson for many years, and they were friends. Um, Jeff worked with a lot of different birds of prey, and he said that Tina was unlike any other bird he'd ever worked with. Uh, doing Training her to do a flying demonstration was extremely different from training any other falcon or hawk or eagle that he'd ever trained, um, in that usually you have to teach them a very rote set of, um, of behaviors to do. You know, you're going to fly to a post and get a food reward, then you're going to come back to the glove, and the, the important thing was never to vary this routine. Well, Tina, if you didn't vary your routine every couple of weeks, she'd get bored and stop doing it. She liked to have new things added to her life all the time. And uh, Jeff, after a couple of years of working with her, started trying to figure out how to test her, um, her knowledge, test what she could do with her mind. And he got her doing really weird things like uh, uh, he would throw a group of stuffed animals over his shoulder and say, go get Miss Piggy. And she would jump down and go get Miss Piggy and bring it back and drop it in the bucket. Or he could even throw them over his shoulder, say, get Miss Piggy. She'd go over, pick up Miss Piggy, and he'd say, wait, I've changed my mind. Get Donald Duck instead. And she would put Miss Piggy down, get Donald Duck, and bring Donald Duck back. Tina would walk back to her own enclosure under her own power and get in her own cage um, because she knew that there was food waiting for her. And she also liked to interact with him and play games and solve puzzles, even when she was completely stuffed with food. Um, it, for her, the interaction uh, seemed to be this this overpowering, um, you know, desire, uh, which is very different from most birds of prey. Which, if once they've had a meal, they're not about to do anything for you. This is Tina's successor, Evita. Uh, Tina died um, that, a few years ago, um, but this, Evita's got the the plumage of a younger bird here, and she's playing with a, a favorite toy, which is an image of one of her ancestors. Now, one of the things that's uh, really interesting about caracaras and falcons in general is that uh, we've learned from DNA evidence that their nearest relatives are not hawks and eagles. Um, their nearest relatives are, in fact, parrots. And uh, this is a, a, a kia, a mountain parrot from New Zealand, which when you, um, it, it's, you can sort of see the resemblance a little bit, um, although I may just be imagining it. Um, but it's, it's uh, parrots we think of as these kind of like tropical vegetarians. And in fact, most parrots will uh, eat meat and uh, kias do quite, quite routinely, um, at least in some populations. And like caracaras, they're very social. Uh, they're very smart. They like to solve puzzles. Um, and you can kind of see the, the, the ancestral linkage between these two. I feel like when you when you meet caracaras in a way that is is harder to see when you're looking at a peregrine because I think they've kind of lost this type of mind. This is William Henry Hudson, um, and before I go into my spiel about him, well, I mean he was uh, just to set the stage. He was born in the 1840s in Argentina in the Pampas, which is this broad, grassy plain south of Buenos Aires, and he grew up there on a sheep farm. Uh, when his parents died, he immigrated to England in his 30s and never returned, but he ended up making a career for himself as a, a sort of a passionate advocate for wildlife in, in Britain. He was one of the founders of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. But he was also a novelist, um, and he spent a lot of time writing about his childhood in South America in these beautiful impressionistic books. There's a memoir called Far Away and Long Ago that I'd especially recommend. Um, and he was just, he was many things at once, kind of like a caracara. And he was one of few European writers and maybe the very first one to say anything nice about caracaras. Even Darwin called them false eagles who ill become so high a rank. He called them disgusting. Um, and there's still kind of this sense, I feel like, that uh, that caracaras are somehow like bad falcons, like that they just don't act like birds of prey are supposed to act. Um, and uh, John, what, uh, what, what were you interested in or what interested you about Hudson, the way that I depicted him? Well, I just think that in, I, I guess I, I don't, I don't imagine a lot of people named uh, William Henry Hudson to be from Argentina. Um, <laughs> no. And, but no, I, I, I just, just what you touched on, just uh, his, his lush descriptions. I mean, what, one of his, what was her name? Uh, 
uh, Rima, right? Like they made Rima, a comic. Yeah, book Rima about the about Jungle Girl. Characters. The... Rima the Jungle Girl. Yeah. And that what which which book was that? That was the. Uh, she was the hero uh, of his his novel Green Mansions, which is probably the most famous book that he wrote. Uh, yeah. He uh, it actually launched. It was the first big hit for Knopf back in 1916 when they re, they published mm. it in America. Although it came out in 1904. And uh, it was even made into a movie eventually starring Audrey Hepburn and uh, Audrey Hepburn, Hepburn. Right. Yeah. Um, the only flop Audrey Hepburn was ever associated with. Um, and it, it's a, it, it really doesn't work as a movie, although it's kind of an interesting failure. But uh, Rima was, uh, even though she, in, in the story, Rima is this, uh, this strange sort of possibly not entirely human um, girl who lives in the tropical forest in Guyana and uh, can talk to animals. And um, the, this, the narrator of the book, this guy named Abel, uh, falls hopelessly and, and, and tragically in love with her. And um, in the end of the book, Rima dies. But uh, this did not stop her from living on in popular culture. Uh, she was uh, eventually, her likeness was bought by DC Comics. And um, I think she appeared just a few years ago. She still was turning up in, in the old Super Friends specials. You could see her as a, as a sort of forest dwelling acquaintance of Wonder Woman. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, I, I think another, I think one of his, his contributions, if I recall correctly, was that he was describing life um, in Argentina at a, at a time where no, no one else was, right? So he yeah. was able to um, kind of uh, paint a picture of, of life um, that, are, that are unique. Yes, that, that scene, the, the, there's a scene that I described or quote really from him where he was talking about visiting Buenos Aires as a child. Had been in the 1840s, and the uh, all the night watchmen in the town that would call the hours every night, you know, las the like, las once andado y all the todo sereno, and like it's just like a medieval scene, and yeah. hearing the different voices of all these different night watchmen all calling all over the city, and it just yeah, I can't think of that being depicted by anyone else. It's like that scene would be completely lost to us if it weren't for him. So I, I just love the way that he wrote and he was really useful as a kind of um, like an avatar almost in the book um, for me, because I didn't want to appear in the book all that much or if I could help it. But Hudson um, uh, loved Caracaras. Um, he grew up with a couple species of them um, and notably had an experience with the, with these guys that crested Caracaras. Um, when he was a child, he climbed up to the nest of uh, of a pair on his family's farm to try to, to steal their eggs. Sorry, this thing's a little bit slow. Uh, and uh, a nest like this. Now, caracaras are unusual in that, or either that or true falcons are unusual, uh, in that caracaras build nests. True falcons mostly don't. Um, they mostly just nest on a, a ledge or, you know, sometimes they'll put a twig or two up there. It's called a scrape. Um, but uh, Crested caracaras build these huge, elaborate nests uh, to the point that in Argentina, there's a you can people sometimes refer to their hair. You know, when you wake up in the morning, your hair's all messed up. It's like a caracara nest. Um, they can do these really big, elaborate constructions. And um, uh, Hudson called these birds lords of the feathered race. He thought they were just really, really smart. They seemed to take advantage of everything on the farm. Um, didn't let anything go to waste. And uh, this bird, even more so, this is another caracara called a chimango. Um, these are small caracaras, I think the smallest, they're about the size of an American crow. And um, they look really kind of insignificant. They're sort of dusty brown, but um, they, uh, but they like to hang out in groups together. They seem really good at learning from one another and from other animals. Uh, and uh, the Hudson said a bird so cosmopolitan in its habits would have no more uh, would have a whole volume to itself in England, but being a poor foreigner has had no more than a few unfriendly paragraphs bestowed upon it. Uh, they are uh, really, really good at learning, and they have learned to deal with people really, really well. They're very common um, at a lot of towns and farms and villages and sometimes even cities. Uh, there was a study uh, by uh, la the biologist Laura Biondi in Argentina where she took a group of chimangas out from the wild. Um, set one aside as a control, um, let, gave one book, group a set of plexiglass boxes that had food inside they had to figure out how to open. And then a, another group um, that watched these birds do that. And they called back and forth to each other, the caged birds and the ones that were free opening the boxes. Um, then when the caged birds uh, were uh, allowed to 
uh, take a turn at the boxes. Almost 84% of them managed to open the boxes, which was much higher than the group that had tried them the first time. It seemed that they were able to actually learn um, just by watching another animal um, do this thing, how to get at the food in this case. And some of them even figured out different ways of opening the boxes. Um, that may not sound so extraordinary, but um, try learning to play the violin by watching someone play the violin. It's really not a common thing for animals to do. Now, Amerindian people throughout South America have had very different attitudes about caracaras from the way Europeans have often presented them. Um, these people are addressed as caracaras. Um, this is in Ecuador in a, a city called Riobamba uh, in, the, in the Andes. And uh, these characters are part of an Inti Raimi parade. Inti Raimi is the, the Inca solstice celebration every year. And uh, these guys are called curiquingues. Um, and they uh, sort of bestow good luck on everyone. They sort of bow and, and uh, fold their wings and stamp, um, mimicking the foraging movements of uh, these birds, carunculated caracaras, which are also locally called curiquingues. And they're really, really striking. Throughout the Andes, um, in South America, Darwin pointed out that there are no crows in, in South America. There are no big black crows. There are some jays in the tropics, which are crow relatives, but um, it's as if the caracaras have taken this place instead or got there first. Uh, and when you go up into the high Andes and you see these things, they look very crowy, but it's like a crow that's really gotten all dressed up. Uh, very striking. And there's a lot of legends and traditions that attach to these birds. Uh, further south in Peru, uh, mountain caracaras, which are very similar, live in habitats like this. This is like 17,000 feet. Those are uh, vicuñas in front there, which are the wild ancestors of alpacas. And in these sort of blasted looking deserts, you'll find these guys, mountain caracaras. Um, this one is actually standing on the ruins of Machu Picchu. And the, uh, the Inca uh, were so uh, valued these birds that only the Inca emperors were permitted to wear their feathers. Uh, in the ceremonial headpiece for the Mascapaicha. This is Inca Huascar, who is the brother of uh, Atahualpa, the last Inca emperor. More recently, uh, this is about two years ago in La Paz in Bolivia during the lockdown, um, this mountain caracara decided to, to visit a family living in a high rise who started feeding it gifts of corn and fruit and meat and being a caracara to lead anything. Um, it liked this arrangement so well that it went away, came back with two friends, and uh, the three of them built a nest together, started uh, and started a, a breeding there as a threesome on a high rise. Let's see here. How did you get that photo? Was that uh, someone you knew, or? Oh, uh, I, 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 this actually turned up on a on a wire uh, report. Um, it was like mm. a BBC thing, and I got it from I got it from Reuters Images, but. Um, just a little human interest story about this bird has come to visit this family. I was like, holy cow, it's a Mount Caracara. Further south in Southern Chile, uh, it, I mean, Caracaras are really good at sort of identifying humans as partners in their search for food uh, in, in many different ways. They, they kind of have different styles of doing it, but, but they often do. And, and maybe in the process of doing that even more actually as we speak. Uh, further south in, in some of the wildest parts of the Southern Andes, this is actually much lower, it's about 5,000 feet. Um, these uh, birds, white-throated caracaras, the ones on the left live, uh, the one on the left with a, with a black vulture friend. Um, this is probably not actually all that good a species really. Um, it, it's genetically nearly identical to mountain caracaras, but uh, they were first identified by Darwin. So I think people are, are loath to, to, to fold them in. Um, but you see them down there. And the, the difference mainly is that they have uh, white feathers all the way up their throat, as you can see. My favorite part of the book, though, takes place in the home of Reba the Jungle Girl in uh, Southern Guyana. And this part is uh, in some ways like, uh, John, in your book, I mean, you, you spent all your time just out in the field with all these really incredible characters, um, including, but not limited to the owls, um, which is what really makes your book just sing because it's so it's so much you know when you're spending hours driving along these roads listening to songs about wolves like heavy metal songs about wolves <laughs> or we're getting roped into um uh you know, the, the student sense of terror that you start to feel when you realize that bottles of vodka are going to come out and you're going to be expected to you know basically down one entire liter on your own um the 
that didn't happen to me exactly in this place, but it was a, a human adventure and more in that in that style. The book kind of goes on a long camping trip about two thirds of the way through and went up this river in remote Southern Guyana um, called the Rewa into one of the most remote parts of all South America. The, the Guyana Shield is in the sort of Northeast part of South America, sandwiched between Venezuela and Brazil. And even though it sort of looks like on a map, it looks like it's covered in the same forest that's covering the Amazon. Um, there are some notable differences um, within the species composition of that forest. And the rivers flow north to the Caribbean, they don't flow south to the Amazon. It's a really ancient, really wild place. I think probably the wildest part of all South America. Um, and we were going looking for these tropical caracaras, of which there are a couple different species. This is the weirdest, maybe the weirdest bird of prey on earth, I would say. I mean, Blackiston's fish oil does give it a run for its money. But these, this, these is are a, weirder. this is a red-throated caracara. Uh, they live in family groups of uh, three to as many as 15 birds been seen, multiple males, multiple females. They nest in giant bromeliads way up off the forest floor, and they eat wasps nests. So in, looking for these guys, um, I went with the most incredible group of people. This is Josie George, who's a Wapishana Amerindian. Um, Rambo Roberts, who's Makushi, uh, and Brian Duncan, who's also Wapishana. And since uh, Guyana was uh, once a, a British colony, the, the uh, language spoken in this region is English. It's like a really fascinating Caribbean English that's really, um, really odd sounding to my ear, but, um, but wonderfully expressed. And it was just so extraordinary to be able to talk in the same language. Um, with them because in most parts of South America, that's completely impossible. Uh, there's Josie with one of the um, uh, one of the river's many residents. Uh, that river is so full of fish that it just like, it, it seemed almost magical, but I had to keep reminding myself that that's, this is a normal river. It's that every other river I've ever encountered is to pop it. Um, this is a, a payara or, or a vampire fish. Uh, and all along the river, there, were, there was evidence of people having come to this place for a very long time. These are marks where people have been sharpening stone tools of some kind um, from when we don't know. Uh, but there could be some of the marks from left by some of the very first Amerindian people to enter South America because they came through the Guyana Shield um, many thousands of years ago. And this is the fourth member of our group. I'm sorry, I should have given you a trigger warning on this one. This is uh, Sean McCann. Um, with, a, with a friend, um, that's the, the Goliath bird-eating tarantula, the largest spider on earth, uh, which crawled up onto Sean voluntarily in a moment that, uh, that's described in the book. Uh, and Sean loves spiders, so he was delighted by this. But Sean um, had spent years in French Guiana, um, a few hundred miles away, studying red-throated caracaras. Uh, because there was a strange mystery about them. Uh, there, some people had suggested that maybe they secreted some kind of wasp repellent, which would help them in their uh, very strange mode of feeding where they attack nests of tropical wasps. And uh, the, the wasps seem to rarely land on the caracaras. Uh, so a couple of different observers had suggested maybe they repel them somehow. I mean, they don't, don't look very well defended. They've got bare skin on their face and throat. Um, and or this one actually, it just looks like a Muppet to me. I can't believe this is a real animal. They, they also, they fly around the forest. Um, they, in, they have sort of territories that they patrol, kind of like a troop of monkeys and anything they see that they think is a problem, uh, they let it know by screaming these really elaborate sort of ritualized calls and waving their wings and their tails in this sort of elaborate dance. Um, and you feel if when they do this to you, um, you feel very taunted. Um, they seem really, really aggressive. And you kind of think, yeah, maybe I should back off. This was, that was a, a great moment in the book where I think you come around a, a bend in a river and there's a whole bunch of them there kind of doing their... Uh, yeah, doing yeah. Their they just, we, we started to despair that we'd thinking that we weren't even going to find them. And then all of a sudden there they were and they just popped up and did this. And it was just like, you know, I, I, I was so, so pleased and a little unnerved. Uh, this is a, a photo that Sean got. This is the first photo of the inside of the nest of a red-throated caracara ever taken. And this young red-throated caracara is 200 feet up in a tree, um, is looking at you going, well, what are you? And you can see some bits of wasp comb there that the adults, that basically all the different adults in this group bring it bits of wasp comb like about every 15 minutes during the day. And But also you can see, uh, I should tell you, I'm not going to tell you 
uh, whether they secrete a wasp propellant or not. Sean did a heck of a lot of work involving a mass spectrometer and, and uh, gas chromatography and electroantonography and all this stuff to figure this out. And he figured out something extraordinary. But uh, what I will tell you is that uh, this millipede you can see here in the bottom of the nest is not a weird anomaly. Um, Sean put a camera on this nest and he, in, in addition to all the wasp comb that the adults brought in, they kept bringing millipedes but they would bring them uh, and just kind of like bite the heads of the millipedes, hold them up to the young bird and then drop them into the bottom of the nest and go away. And the young bird wouldn't eat them. And why they do this is not entirely clear, but um, Sean suspects that uh, millipedes are, they're one of the older invertebrates on land. Um, they're, they're fossil millipedes from 400 million years ago. And uh, the reason they seem to have survived is because they just taste really terrible. That they they're covered in these things called repugnatory glands. And if you disturb them, they'll ooze this sort of noxious stuff. Uh, and some of them can even squirt poison by a couple of feet. Um, but even the millipedes that may live around you, if you pick them up and, and, and annoy them, and, and they'll, they'll leave you a little sort of weird chemical burn on your arm. Uh, but the let me ju is, jump in real quick. Uh, yeah. Jonathan, we, we have about 15 minutes left. And I just want to make sure that uh, people who are yeah. watching, if you have a question for Jonathan, please put it into the chat. I see two questions there right now. Yeah, if okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to, I'll, I'll kick it up a notch here. Um, but with the millipedes, the, the, John's guess is they may be basically using it as a pest, pest control. Uh, some monkeys will anoint themselves with millipedes and some lemurs will also. They kind of get high off of it, there seem to. Um, and it may be that that's in fact what they're doing, that they're using them to repel ticks and mosquitoes and all the other things that want to live in you in the tropics, um, bot flies and such. The, if that's true, these birds are using a chemical technology, which is pretty interesting kind of tool use. It's another tropical caracara, black caracara. These guys look like something the Adams family would keep as a pet. Uh, and here's one that uh, was trying to figure out how to get some food away from this vulture. And finally, he just charged at the vulture and grabbed some food in, in one foot and hopped away on the other one like this. <laughs> the typical Karakara move, kind of clownish and inventive and effective. This is, uh, oh, uh, there we go. I wanted to show you this. This is a yellow-headed Karakara, a youngster. And uh, this animal that's sitting on is a tapir, which is this weird thing. It looks sort of like a pig with a trunk. They're actually from North America, but they died out in North America, but survived in like going into South America and uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, this tapir is fine. It's not dead or anything. This caracara is picking it over for uh, ticks and other skin parasites. And the tapirs uh, are uh, happy enough about this arrangement. If they see a yellow-headed caracara, sometimes they'll roll over on their backs like a dog. Like, okay, but time for cleaning. This uh, is a Guadalupe Caracara. It's the only bird of prey known to have been uh, driven to extinction by human beings in historical time. Um, it's sort of similar to the crested Caracara as you saw earlier, but it lived on the island of Guadalupe off of Baja California. Uh, and the, on December 1st, 1900, an American bird collector named Varola Beck uh, landed on the island, saw 11 of them, shot nine of them. The other two got away, even though he said he did shoot at them um, and they were uh, never seen again. This is one of 34 known skins to exist. Uh, it's in the Smithsonian. And this is a northern, uh, this is a crested caracara that is, uh, aside from being really handsome, uh, is uh, a wild bird that is sitting in a tree in Skykomish, Washington, about 30 miles east of Seattle. Uh, crested caracaras have been turning up uh, further and further north uh, in recent years. They've been all as far as, uh, they've been as far up as Nova Scotia and Alberta and Vancouver. Uh, and they were all over uh, uh, what's now the United States during the Pleistocene, the era of the mastodons and saber-toothed tigers and stuff. Um, they're in the La Brea tar pits, um, but they seem to have retreated south um, when the big mammals went extinct, uh, not, probably not coincidentally along with the arrival of larger numbers of humans. Uh, but now they seem to sort of be coming back. And... Uh, they may be coming back in the, in the company of an old friend. Black vultures were also here in greater numbers uh, back in those days. And they've made a, a huge return in recent years, um, probably uh, because there's a predator in, Nor in North America now that uh, rivals anything that ever existed in the Pleistocene, and that's cars. Um, the number of deer estimated killed on highways in the US in 2016 is equal to the wildebeest population of the Serengeti. And, that doesn't even include uh, foxes and cats and skunks and 
possums and all the other roadkill that lines up so beautifully and, and predictably along the sides of roads uh, throughout the United States every every morning. Um, these scavenging birds seem to be um, seem to have twigged to this, and they've they're they're using it. It's like we've laid out this new habitat for them, and I think caracaras are, are what you're witnessing when you see them coming back is a rare sort of reversal of, of a local Pleistocene extinction. And this here is Diego Ramirez. These are islands off the very southern tip of South America, south even of Cape Horn, and um, on these little bits of rock are the southernmost bit of the South American continental plate before it uh, dips below the waves and about 500 miles away is Antarctica. This is, uh, there are penguins and albatrosses here. There are also striated caracaras here, which makes them the southernmost birds of prey on earth. Um, they could fly east or west of these islands and see nothing but water until they saw these islands again. And uh, that brings them as close, I think, as any falcons have come to their ancestral homeland, um, which I think is in Antarctica, which is in part the subject of my next book. And I will stop here and I will take questions in the time that remains. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, you... you uh... You, you definitely uh, answered all of the questions that I had uh, set aside. So we'll, we'll go right to questions from folks. Um, I, I will say it really is like everything that, that Jonathan's talked about here. It's, you know, it's, it's history, it's, it's uh, um, biography, uh, it's natural history of all these characters. And it's, it's told in, in just a, a really beautiful way. So it's, if you haven't read it, now that it's in paperback, it's cheap. So um, I think you should. Yes, with two typos fixed. Yeah. And 100% more Ecuador on the on the map. The Ecuador is now labeled on the map. That's right. Um, okay, so the first question this is from Jay Dillon, uh, who would like to know. Um, I think this is for both of us. Uh, yeah, what you both hope to take away from your books. I'm sorry. Uh, what you hope people will take away from your books. One, um, and is there a particular experience uh, you'd point to that got you interested in birds? So first question, uh, what do you hope people will take away from your book? For me, it, it's, it's a sense that one thing I realized by the end of the book is that I could have started anywhere with any species almost and gotten to this story because the story gets so big mm -hmm. by the end of it, it ends mm -hmm. up being about the movement of the continents and why South America and North America are so different and, you know, why the world is the way it is. And almost any species can tell you a story like this if you want to follow it. Um, in the, a sense of how much we really don't know about the world. When I was a kid, I thought scientists already knew everything. And it's, it's just not so. There's so much that's not known about this group of very flashy big birds of prey. That's a neat, they're easy to see. You know, right. I think about all the things that are harder to see, uh, how, how much, if, if we don't know that much about a group like this, what else do we not know about everything that's less conspicuous? Yeah, and I, I think that, that plays in your next book, right? focusing yeah. on some of the, the, the lesser known parts of the world and then the, the creatures that, that live there. Um, I think for me, it's, 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 a, it's a strange week to be saying it, but I think the, you know, kind of the, the message of my book is one of hope and that uh, humans and uh, if we can get along with each other, uh, humans and the natural world can, can coexist. We are part of the world. They are part of the world. If we all come at it with, uh, uh, with an even keel, um, I think we can all get through it. I guess that's sort of the, um, what I hope people will take away from my book. Um, and so the, the second question was, what was there a particular experience that, uh, that got you interested in birds, Jonathan? Well, it's the one I mentioned in the book, the, the striated caracaras were really the thing that hit me over the head. Um, but I have to say birds are kind of like a gateway drug though. It's, it's, um, uh, Sean refers to jumping spiders as gateway spiders, you know, because I got short legs and the guys and they're real cute and everybody likes them. Um, uh -huh. And, you know, you can work your way up from there sort of. And, and I feel that way with, with birds. It's like they're, they're so attractive and, and, and immediately interesting and identifiable. Um, but you can sort of keep going from there into to the rest of the, the, the living world. And the, the project I'm working on now has a lot to do with these invertebrate communities that I didn't know anything about that are equally fascinating, but they're but just not as well known. Right. Yeah, I think for, for me, it was a uh, um, jealousy. Um, I, have a, <laughs> I had a, a, a high school friend who's now an evolutionary biologist at uh, Gettysburg College in, in Pennsylvania, who um, uh, 
he was visiting. So I knew him in high school and he was visiting my freshman year in college and we were walking somewhere and he just saw some bird and said, Oh, look, it's a blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, what do you, how do you know what that is? Like, Oh, I've, I've taken up bird watching. I, I now identify birds. Yeah, so I just, I, I went to the, I've always had this, I, I historically in high school I had this sort of uh, uh, friendly competition with him about uh, meaningless things. <laughs> and I just, I went, I went to a used bookstore. I got a, you know, an old guide, a Peterson guide and started, um, started bird watching. So that's, that's what got me into it. Um, Do you remember what the species was at that first time? And, and I don't, and I, I wish I did. I'm sure it was, it was something, it was probably a purple finch or a house finch, you know, it was some mundane species in uh, central New Jersey, you know? Um, yeah. So. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Flippy. Uh, wants to know, is it possible to buy the book in Peru or order online? Do you have any idea? I think you can order online as it would have to be an import, but but yeah. Um, yeah. It'd, it'd probably have to come from the U.S. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's one of my great, great regrets that there are not regrets, but um, but there are, the book does not have any South American publishers right now, which I think is a great shame. I, I would love for the book to be translated and, and available there. Um, my, yeah, my I mean, Spanish skills are not basically. good enough for me to do the translation myself, but it, it would be would be a real joy for me for that to happen. Yeah, I, I mean, so much of it is really a, kind of an, an ode to the to the beauty of, of South America. Of South America, um, yeah, and, and that it's, it's completely it's so history. different from North America. They're really two new worlds, not one. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, Martin K wants to know what are the best places to see caracaras in El Paso, New Mexico, and mainland Chile. Uh, El Paso and New Mexico. El Paso, you're in good shape. The um, right da right down along the Rio Grande, there's they're quite common. I mean, South Texas, they're um, uh, with, with just just the, uh, the the crested's the crested's yeah the crested caracaras uh, the probably southern new mexico i don't know if that they, they come up into the north of new mexico in particular but i'm not certain um but there's been uh joan morrison's been studying them on uh, i think pecan orchards in i think arizona although possibly new mexico where they've they've uh, uh learned to to shell pecans and eat them wow that's great Oh, and um, sorry, but Chile, mainland Chile. Chile. Um, mountain caracaras are up in the in the Atacama, um, and uh, you know, in the in the central part to the south, Chimango caracaras are very common, almost everywhere. Uh, Pablo Neruda would, wrote a poem about them, and um, and crested caracaras as well. Um, White-throated caracaras in the far south, uh, and even on a few of the Chilean islands, striated caracaras. Although those islands are really hard to get to, I've never been to them. Um, but uh, there are so there, I guess that's how many is that? That's one, two, three, four, four, five species just in Chile. And, and those are all some of the more uh, uh, visible caracaras. It's not like the the red the red throats that are kind of hiding. Or, or the red throats are probably the only one that's a little bit tricky to see. You got to go to primary yeah. tropical forest that's not particularly disturbed to find them usually. Although there's some in pine forests in Honduras. Apparently, there's a little population of them mm -hmm. there. Um, but but when the primary forest goes down, the red throats tend to go with it. Yeah. Okay. All right. See. So, uh, well, Jay Dillon says yay in bird words. Um, <laughs> and uh, Terry Brown wants to know what you're working on now. I think you, you talked about it a little bit, but do you want to expand? Um, or, sure. If you're yeah, it, it's a book about Antarctica. Um, Antarctica kept looming in this book that as a as the place that, among other things, I think the falcons basically came from. I think the falcon parrot ancestor probably lived in Antarctica. Um, but Antarctica from uh, was warm at the time of the Cretaceous extinctions when most of the dinosaurs go away. Uh, and uh, and then it remained warm for another thirty million years after that. And uh, there's evidence to suggest that Antarctica did not suffer as much as the rest of the world. And during the Cretaceous extinctions and things that lived there were able to repopulate um, parts of especially the Southern hemisphere. And there are still Antarctic forests today. Uh, they're just not in Antarctica. They're in places like Chile and New Zealand and New Caledonia. Mm -hmm. There are even Antarctic trees with an Antar Antarctic origins in Borneo. Uh, and uh, so the book is partly about that, um, partly about the uh, incredibly strange and wonderful community of life that was created in the ocean 
when South America and Antarctica finally separated from one another, uh, which changed the whole world. Uh, and uh, then it's also about what, uh, what's gonna happen to Antarctica in the future. So it's called The Secret Land, The Once and Future Life of Antarctica. Wow. So, yeah. The book about Antarctica a, without, you... uh, with no, no polar explorers, very few penguins or whales or icebergs. Yeah. And you have just started working on this, is that correct? How, yes, I've just started working on it. Working on it. So it'll be, be a few years yet. Yeah, I, I am. I'm working on something, but I, I'm, I'm not allowed to say what it is yet because I haven't. I'm, I'm hoping to have a uh, a proposal in front of a publisher. Well, it's supposed to be by uh, uh, February 28th. Um, that didn't happen, but it'll be soon. So I'll you gotta get right on. <laughs> I was, you know, I I felt like when when my book came out, um, it was during the pandemic. So I've done zero actual in person appearances at all. Yeah. I've been virtual. Yeah. But um. I was really glad that it hadn't come out the year earlier because that would have been the start of the pandemic. So I figure I get a year guilt free of not not chastising myself for not having finished my book yet. Yeah, I'm actually I'm giving my first uh, in person talk uh, to support the Al book next week in in, in Florida. Oh, that's uh, awesome! Congratulations. Yeah, my, my book came out in in August of 2020, and it's yeah. This is all I've done. I haven't seen anybody in person. Um. Let's see, Vicki Pierce, if I pronounce that last name correctly, says that uh, she's an invertebrate biologist who started with birds. So good for you. Um, so the, 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 the path uh, is <laughs> identifying the path correctly. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, Caroline Mann, if you're, if you're okay answering this, wonders what you're doing in Germany. Oh, um, my, uh, my partner is, uh, just took a job as a curator of, uh, of worms um, at the Natural History Museum here in Hamburg. Uh, so I'm a trailing spouse. Great. Uh, one more just came in from, from Martin K. Uh, what is your advice for a young naturalist scientist preparing to graduate? Um, M Martin K, can you just clarify that? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> college. Um, so graduate college, so undergraduate. Uh, yeah, like you, you want a job or talk? yeah um what would you say yeah what would i say i would say i mean i guess i would i would, I would wonder how what stage you are in, in in college um i guess something that i say to a lot of you know i i, I do some work with with big cats with tigers with leopards and you get a lot of people who want to study big cats they want to study tigers they want to study leopards they don't care so much about the frogs, the, the invertebrates. Um, and I think that a lot of the skills that you learn in college are applicable to other, other taxa. Um, and so I would say, get the job you can, um, because what you know can be um, applied more broadly and then try to you know, uh, narrow in on, on your dream job over time. I mean, when, yeah, when I started if working- If you can find an, an something that's interesting to you that not a lot of other people are interested in, um, even though that seems in a way kind of counterintuitive, it, it does seem to lead to opportunities sometimes because if you want to talk, if somebody wants to talk about that thing, they're going to have to come to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I, when I got my, uh, uh, my, my PhD, I took a job as a grant writer because there wasn't a job doing birds. And over the, over the last 10 years, I've made it a bird job because I've just been able to hone it and hone it and hone it to the point where I'm more doing birds now than, than, than anything else. So um, don't, don't pigeonhole yourself, Martin, I guess is what I'd say. So to speak. Right. Or, or do, if you, if, if you do, don't, or, do, or don't do. pigeonhole yourself into a thing that everybody else is also trying to do. Brian Eno said that, uh, that about pop music, that the, everybody was all trying to hit the middle of this one expensive target and that he, his, he preferred to fire the arrow and then paint the target around it. Neat. Yeah, great. Um, unless I see something else, uh, uh, music. I, I'm curious about that. Are you are you still recording? Oh yes. Um, the, yeah, there's a new Shearwater album that uh, it's coming out in June on June 10th. Um, and there's a the, my other band Loma is also working on a new record that hopefully we'll have done before the end of the year. So yeah, I'm, I'm still still got a foot in in that world. Good. Uh, Mar uh, Linda Marie just chimed in to say, great to hear your talk. I already own both of your books. 
Uh, Linda is a botanist slash birder. So great. Glad you have them. Thank Glad you, Linda. You, um... Okay. Uh, if that's uh, if that's it for everybody, is there any, anything less uh, that we want to we want to talk about, Ted, for either the two of you? I think I'm good. Think good. My, my brain is is really well on the way to shutting down at this point. Okay, sounds it's good. It's what three thirty? <laughs> yeah, about three thirty. <laughs> All right, let's get the two of you out of here then. <laughs> um, thank you very much to, uh, to everybody that showed up in the audience, to all of our botanists and birders and college students, the soon-to-be naturalists. Um, it's really, really lovely to see all of you here. Uh, if you'd like to purchase uh, uh, either of the books tonight, which again is A Most Remarkable Creature or Owls of the Eastern Ice, uh, which is Jonathan Slate's book, um, you can find both of them. Uh, they're linked further up in the chat or either of them are at bookpassage.com where you can purchase them there. And I'm sure you can find them both on their uh, respective websites as well. Um, either way, we are, are just so excited to have everybody out uh, tonight and anybody that's watching this after the fact on YouTube. Um, remember to uh, subscribe to our channel to find more videos just like this. We do everything from, uh, you know, finance books to, you know, uh, family drama fiction to books about uh, really, really cool uh, birds. Can't, can't get more than that. Anyways, thank you one last time for coming out, everybody. Hope to see All you right. in the next one. Bye. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, good to see you again. You too.